The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having business before this court are admonished to draw an eye and give their attention to the court. Good afternoon. Welcome to council and to those who are watching on our Supreme Court live channel. This time I would ask Mr. Doug Shima, the clerk of the appellate court to please call the afternoon docket. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. The 1.30 p.m. docket for Monday, March 29th, 2021 consists of one case. Appeal number 114919, State of Kansas versus Frazier Glenn Cross Jr. Johnson County briefs both sides. The appellant has reserved five minutes rebuttal time. Your Honor, we're ready to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Shima. I might explain to those who might be in our audience that this afternoon's argument is a continuation of arguments in this appeal. We heard other arguments this morning. So we uh, do have new counsel to argue the, the issue before us now and we welcome them. Uh, so at this point, I would ask those counsel to please state their appearances. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Meryl Carver Almond, Capital Appellate Defender, on behalf of Mr. Cross. Good afternoon, and may it please the court, Brant Lau, Solicitor General of Kansas, arguing for the state of Kansas as appellee. Thank you, counsel. Ms. Carver Almond, you may begin your argument. Thank you, Chief. May it please the court. This argument today has been billed as an argument about whether the Kansas death penalty is unconstitutional under section one of our Kansas Bill of Rights, the provision that protects our right to life. But this isn't really an argument about whether the death penalty in Kansas should be banned for all time. What this is really about today is what the state has to show before it can take away a Kansas citizen's clearly enumerated fundamental right to life. Now in Hodes, this court set out a framework for how we consider violations of fundamental rights. And all we are asking today is that this court follow Hodes. The state on the other hand is arguing that there is an exception in the right to life when it seeks to impose the death penalty based on the text of our constitution, based on the history of our state and based on substantive due process, the state's argument is wrong. Of course, we start with the text. And the most important thing that I want this court to hear me say today is something that this court actually said in the Hodes case. And that is that section one of our Kansas constitution is not the 14th amendment due process clause. Our rights in Kansas are broader and namely that there is no language in our constitution that allows the taking of life by due process of law. Now I'm going to get to liberty in just a minute. I wanna address that separately. Chapman was discussing the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause, which is, of course, identical to the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause. And Chapman and also um, Meacham versus Fano, which is a case that's cited in that portion of Chapman that talks about it, they talk about how it is the Due Process Clause that authorizes the constitutional deprivation of fundamental rights once someone has been convicted of a crime. So really, because we don't have that language, any case that relies on that 14th Amendment or Fifth Amendment due process clause language is really irrelevant to Section 1. We don't have that due process language in our Constitution. Now, I said I'd address liberty separately in a minute, so I want to get to that in the context of Section 6. Section 6 says, there shall be no slavery in this state and no involuntary servitude except for punishment of a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. And there is, I think about 150 pages of law review articles and case citations in our brief. And it, you know, it's much more than we could possibly get into today. But our position is that based on that, under looking at it historically, looking at it through the lens of Locke in theory, slavery was the deprivation of all fundamental rights. It was a social or civil death. Involuntary servitude is something less than that. And the founders would have understood involuntary servitude as penal labor, as being sent to the penitentiary. So to the extent that this court wants to distinguish between life and liberty, and I can understand certainly why you would, um, there is a textual basis. We have a due process clause as to liberty, liberty, not life. The other thing that I certainly want to address in the textual portion of my argument is obviously we have to deal with section nine somehow. 
Section nine, of course, mentions capital punishment, but just because it mentions capital punishment doesn't mean that the death penalty is constitutional uh, in all circumstances. And the Washington Supreme Court recognized that in Gregory and the Connecticut Supreme Court recognized it in Peeler. And there, the Connecticut Supreme Court said, one could grant the argument that the death penalty is not categorically impermissible while maintaining that the conditions for its constitutional use are not currently satisfied and may never be. And this is really the fundamental difference between what we're arguing today and what the attorneys argued in Clapus 1. In Clapus 1, they were saying that the death penalty was categorically impermissible. Doesn't matter how you write the statute, doesn't matter what compelling interest the state can show, we just can't have a death penalty in Kansas because inalienable means inalienable. After Hodes, we know, because this court has told us, that those Section 1 rights actually can be violated. They are not uh, inalienable in the colloquial sense, but the state just has to meet certain conditions first. And I don't want to try to be coy or hide the ball here. It will be very hard for the state to meet those conditions. Um, Can I um, stop you there? Because I want to, I, I think we need to talk about the framework of how as you say hodes, I think we, we often say hodes. So if we say that, we're saying we're referring to the same case, just so people understand. Um, that it was that case was looking at something in a very different framework. And that was whether or not the state could infringe upon a constitutional right to make something a crime. Here, that is not the question before us. The question is once you have violated a, and committed a crime, what are the natural rights that attach at that point? And um, that those are two different questions. Would you agree? I actually disagree with that, Your Honor. Under the text of our Constitution, again, we have a, a due process clause for liberty. We don't have one for life. So there isn't a textual distinction there for that in our Constitution. I, I think there is. And I, okay. think that we're, I think that textual... I mean, arguably, at least, that that textual difference is in Section 1 itself when it refers to natural rights, which I believe is, or at least as we said in Hodes, we referred back to an, a Lockean and, nat, and other natural rights philosophers. Um, and those, uh, and, and a natural rights philosophy recognizes uh, the concept that through your actions, you can forfeit that right by committing a crime. And in fact, Locke speaks of uh, the power to kill a murderer if that happens. So does the natural right language itself um, make that distinction of the, uh, of the concept of forfeiture that wasn't at play in Hodes? Well, Two things to that, Justice Lukert. And, and first, I want to take on this idea of the Lockean defense of a death penalty, um, because the state, the state cites an article in their brief that is, that is titled just that, right? And there is uh, one sentence that they have pulled out that says, essentially, Locke would have been okay with the death penalty. But if you read that whole article, and it, and it quotes extensively from Locke's second treatise, first of all, that article itself posits itself as a defense of the idea that the death penalty is theoretically morally permissible. So we're talking about there, there's a big difference between the death penalty in theory and the death penalty in practice. Second, it quotes Locke as justifying the death penalty in terms of self-defense, in terms of deterrence, in terms of incapacitation, and also requiring that the state submit to tight controls and show that the death penalty is for the public good. There may be circumstances in which the state can meet those showings. Those are arguably the showings that we are saying they should make. Second to your question, even if we assume that there is some kind of forfeiture when someone commits a crime, then the question becomes kind of how much forfeiture. Even at the founding, it wasn't a life for a life. Um, we had second degree murder, which was the only difference between second degree murder and first degree murder at the founding was um, actually premeditation. There was malice in both murders. So just because some sort of forfeiture is required doesn't necessarily mean that the death penalty is permissible under that Lockean and natural rights guarantee. And uh, kind of while we're 
on that subject, I think, I think that's a nice segue into a portion of our Kansas history that I didn't really even fully understand until I started looking at this issue. And that is looking at the death penalty in terms of our need to keep folks safe. And when you look at that founding era, of course, in 1859, the death penalty was, was brought in on the, on the heels of the bogus legislature, with this, which this court has already said does not reflect the will of the people at the time. The only affirmative law created for the death penalty at the time was for treason, um, which is a, a sort of different category of, the, of crime, um, you know, crime against individuals versus crimes against the state. And we only had the death penalty for about a decade in that initial period. And the reason that it went away, and, and we have contemporaries cited in our brief saying that this is the reason that it went away, um, Senator Rogers, Justice Bailey, is because they had a prison to put people in. They could keep society safe without the death penalty. And when you're looking at uh, that Lockean theory, um, yes, in a theoretical sense, it might justify the death penalty. I, I think I agree with you there, Justice Lupert, but it, it justifies it in terms of how much we need it to keep society safe. And in the era we live in now, where we have uh, very, very good prisons and also life without possibility of parole, it's not something that we need anymore. Um, and- Counsel, can I, sure. before you continue on, so are you, do you concede then that the, the meaning of inalienable incorporates the concept of forfeiture? For, that's my first part of my question. Um, why don't you, let's just start there. I, I don't know that I wanna concede that. I think that the two words mean different things. Um, and, and even at the founding, they're kind of talking about them as two different concepts of inalienable textually being something different than forfeiture. And I've spent a lot of time this last week thinking about the difference. And, um, I, you know, in the convention, at least, they're talking about inalienable is in terms of it can't be sold or disposed of by the person. And forfeiture in this context seems more like um, I guess you would define it as the person doing an affirmative act that gives up the right somehow. So they, there are some differences. Let, let me let me just jump in here because it, it goes along with Justice Wall's uh, question. How is it? Does an inalienable imply absolute? I mean, is 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 it an absolute right that is not subject to forfeiture? Um, and I I don't think any of the philosophers and then what was discussed at the Constitutional Convention contemplated that they were absolute. Um, but what's your what's your response to that? Because I think there's kind of a a logical chain here. Is it absolute? And if it's not absolute, then can it be forfeited? Well, I think that in in Clapis one and in Hodes, this court acknowledged that that right is not absolute. And then, as you say, the question becomes, when do we forfeit it? And but also there's no language specifically saying when we forfeit it. If, for example, as there is in section six that says you can forfeit your freedom by due process of law. So uh, there's no, you know, it, it's, it's capable of being forfeited. And that's, and that's kind of where the constitutional interpretation here comes in. And when you look at what the founders did, um, even on and above what they said, as soon as it's, it's, I like to think of it this way, the, the right hasn't changed throughout the centuries, the right to life hasn't changed, but the underlying conditions and compelling interests for the death penalty under that right have changed. And as they change, um, it's not that the constitution changes, it's the underlying co conditions that we're applying it to change. And on that point, what is our standard of review? If we, if we were to agree with you that there is a right that is being infringed on, what standard of review do we apply to the infringement? Well, we're arguing that at that point it's strict scrutiny and the state has to meet its burden to show a compelling state interest and that the death penalty um, is narrowly tailored to further that interest. And that would um, dovetail with your suggestion that um, under a strict scrutiny review, the outcome can actually change over time. 
because of changing circumstances? I think it can. I think that the compelling interest could change. And for example, um, I mean, there are ways to narrowly tailor a death penalty law more than we do, right? Um, depending on, and part of the problem here is that we are kind of shadow boxing because the state hasn't argued strict scrutiny at all. They haven't put forth anything. And so we don't know uh, in more than a very general way what their compelling interests are, all of that. And so it's hard for me to say, you could narrowly tailor the law this way and it might pass muster. But for example, if you were worried about folks um, who are already in prison serving life without possibility of parole, then killing someone else, maybe you could narrowly tailor the death penalty that to that. There are ways that um, the state could possibly meet strict scrutiny. And of course, this court would have to evaluate it on a case by case basis. But what we're saying is um, this probably isn't it. <laughs> And well, just, uh, I'm sorry, one last question, Justice Rosen. i just trying to clarify the, the actual arguments. Um, if this court were to conclude that an individual in Mr. Cross's situation has no Section 1 rights whatsoever, then there's no, would you agree with me that there's not really any standard, or, there's, that, ends the, that ends the case on this question now? We don't have to proceed to what standard of review because there's not even a right being protected. Well, our position is Justice Stegall, and, and as you said in your dissent in Hodes, the government is still, uh, you know, can't act in arbitrary and unreasonable ways. How we kind of see this going from here is, um, you know, it's, it's obviously up to this court to decide if we're in fundamental rights land or we're not in fundamental rights land. If we are not in fundamental rights land, then we've argued that rational basis review still applies and we think we can meet that and we've asked for a remand for the opportunity to do that. If we are in fundamental rights, oh, go ahead, Justice Siegel, sorry. No, I, and I, I appreciate the way you're articulating that. I'm just asking you, um, uh, there is a third possibility, right? Which is no right, no right is being protected at all. And I understand you totally disagree with that, but just analytically, if there's no right, then we don't have to get to a standard of review. I guess that's what I'm asking. Because if there's no I'm right, if it's been trouble imagining, oh, I'm sorry, Justice Eagle. Well, if it's been completely forfeited, then um, there's there can be no infringement of a right. And legally speaking, from an analytical perspective, um, courts oftentimes try to determine what test they use to measure an infringement. Sorry, I didn't hear that last word that you said, Justice Siegel. I'm probably belaboring the point unnecessarily. I, I, I'm just trying to categorize the different possibilities between there's no right and so there's no infringement versus if there is an infringement, how do we evaluate that? Well, and I think you're talking about if there's no right at all versus there's no fundamental right. I think maybe that's the distinction you're making. And I guess I don't see where anywhere in our text, in our history, in any of it, that um, there's absolutely no right to life that you give up. And and I think that that also, and I, I realize I'm out of time. I, I want to wrap this part up very quickly, um, if I may, Justice Lukert. Um, I think you know, that, that gets to kind of my third prong of the argument too, which is that substantive due process dictates um, that this court consider this right. Um, you know, it's the most weighty interest there is. Life is not a fundamental right. Life is the fundamental right. And I think Justice Biles in his concurrence in Hodes said that the interest at stake for our citizens must dictate the degree of judicial scrutiny given when the government seeks to intrude on those interests. And really, even for prisoners, even for people who have committed a crime, they still have fundamental rights. They have the right to practice their religion. They have the right to get married. They have the right to be free of racial discrimination. They have some rights to liberty even, right? We're not, we're not tying, to people, um, tying people to chairs in their cells. They can move about their cell. They can move about the prison depending on their custody level, we don't forfeit all of our fundamental rights when we commit a crime. And it's interesting because all of those rights, you can kind of put them on a dimmer switch. You can kind of adjust them depending on the circumstances. It's only the right to life that is an on-off switch. And in our view, that makes that very unique. 
and makes it entitled to um, the weightiest protection that this court can give it. You know, uh, again, citing to Justice Files, we're not talking about an ice cream cone stand here. We're talking about the right to have all rights in the state's power to extinguish it. And uh, with that, I see that I'm out of time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If you have forfeiture, which uh, seems like by common definition means that you have given up that right through your act, does then the governing, uh, you're no longer under section one to look for your standard, but section nine and cruel and unusual punishment? Is that the framework that our, our founders put in place? Well, they sort of work together, right? And I think that they recognize that in Furman, that, um, you know, and they, there's kind of, I think of it, uh, you know, Furman is more of a substantive uh, due process decision and Greg is more of a procedural due process decision. Um, I mean, given the parameters of your question, Justice Luker, yes, I disagree with the parameters of your question, obviously. You, you disagree with that you can forfeit a fundamental right and that or the fundamental right to life. Is that is that what you disagree with? Yes. And, and that is because, um, first of all, there's nothing in the text that says that. And second, I think that there are, are very open questions. Again, um, <laughs> really, even most of the people in this state that commit capital murder are serving life without possibility of parole sentences. Let's let's be honest, some of the people that have been sentenced to death sentences, such as Mr. Cross, who is 80 years old, are serving life without possibility of parole sentences. So um, it, it seems to me to be reading a lot, even, even assuming forfeiture, it seems to me to be reading a lot into that um, this, this life for life idea, because that's not, that's not even what we do. That's not what we've ever done. But, but if, if, if in the term inalienable incorporates the concept of forfeiture, arguably that, that could serve as a textual basis on, under section one, correct? I don't understand. I, I think um, those are different words. Um, well, so if, the, if the meaning of the term inalienable is something different than absolute and, and is a concept that is uh, defined to include forfeiture, I guess. I think that still, again, even assuming forfeiture is, is possible, which obviously I disagree with, you get to the idea of how much forfeiture of your rights and um, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm looping back around, um, we're, we're, I'm chasing my tail here, but, um, there is still a question of, do you give up your whole right to life? You know, some people would say life without possibility of parole, uh, you know, it's obviously a lesser punishment than the death penalty, but that is giving up your life. So is that the kind of forfeiture we're talking about? Are we talking about giving up a portion of your life? There are different levels of forfeiture, even assuming forfeiture is, um, is incorporated somehow into the text of section one. Let me, uh, if, if we, I'm, I've got on my other screen here, section six. And so let me ask the question this way. If we don't accept your reading of section six, the slavery provision to permit some sort of other test for imprisonment, which would be a denial of liberty, then whatever test we would adopt for the section one life argument would have to be the same for liberty, right? Assuming, yeah, I believe that's right. Okay. But that being said, Justice Biles, there are different compelling interests, for example, for life without possibility of parole. Um, and in fact, there's kind of a, there's kind of a duality in it, in that um, in a world where we don't have capital punishment, life without possibility of parole becomes more compelling. 
um, because incapacitation comes back in as a compelling interest. And, um, you know, there, there are different arguments that you can make, even assuming they're both under the same test. Um, liberty is, is really a different issue and, and not an issue that's before this court today, although obviously I understand why you're concerned about it. No, I mean, I can, I mean, I know there are a lot of different arguments and one that I'm focused on would be uh, criminal defendants arguing that there's not a compelling difference between being sentenced to 10 years and 20 years. And so the state has to show by strict scrutiny that that extra 10 years makes a difference. And that's where I think this test falls down. And you know, I've got to tell you, I think it is a wild stretch to make Section 6 carve out liberty or imprisonment the way you do, because it clearly is only about slavery. And we know from the Wyandotte Convention that that was only about trying to make sure that a slavery prohibition couldn't be used in the prisons for, for criminal punishment. And so that's what that's there for. That doesn't, that doesn't create a different path for analyzing uh, deprivation of liberty in, in my mind. So I really think this is a big hurdle. And you know, if you can talk me down from that, that's fine. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just telling you that's my problem. I was I was skeptical of that argument at first as well. And so I guess and and again it is it is probably more than we could get into if we had five hours today. But I would urge you to go back and look at those law review articles we've cited in our brief, look at that uh research. And it's 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 really interesting to how um It's, it's hard, and I agree with you to some extent, because very few states even have that same provision that we have. There are only four other states that have that same provision, but it is clear, at least from the historical side of it, that that involuntary servitude part was penal labor, um, which is the modern equivalent to being sent to prison. So um, I, I, I guess I, the best I can do is urge you to go back and look at that again um, without spending more time than we all they have today. Yeah, and, and I did. Um, I also looked back and I, you know, because section one was proposed by uh, Samuel Kingman, it was interesting to me that every one of the nine uh, executions that occurred right after statehood, he was on the Supreme Court and even presided or, or even sat on one of the appeals on the execution side. So uh, you know, for language that's supposed to prevent this, it seems odd that the author of the provision doesn't raise his hand. Well, and that again goes back to what was historically happening. Honestly, Justice Biles, um, I am, you know, obviously a pretty fierce death penalty abolitionist, and I would have trouble sitting here today arguing before you in a world where there is no place to put people who commit horrible crimes that we don't need to to have some way to just incapacitate them. And in that early period, in that first decade, again, remember, there was no penitentiary during that period. What else were they supposed to do with those folks? Um, and then again, you have, you know, Justice Bailey, also a justice on this court, also in the legislature as well. Um, as soon as that penitentiary was built, the main law was passed and we were done with capital punishment for the entire founding era. And that was a legislative policy decision, not a judicial act, correct? That was a legislative policy decision, yes. And, um, you know, of course, the legislature makes a lot of policy decisions. And when those policy decisions go outside of the bounds of the Constitution, then it's it's this court's job to rule on them, um, as this court has done recently. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lau. Good afternoon and may it please the court. Brant Lau, Solicitor General on behalf of the state of Kansas. This court's decision in Hodes and Nauser has no effect on whether the Kansas death penalty is unconstitutional under section one of the Bill of Rights of the Kansas Constitution. 
Essentially, that is so for three reasons. First, the text of the Constitution itself recognizes capital offenses, thus raising the illogical suggestion that the founders banned something in section one that they included in section nine, a point recognized by this court in the Claypus decision. Second, the Constitution was adopted in a historical legal setting that accepted capital punishment. The territorial statutes before the adoption of the Constitution included capital punishment. The original state statutes after statehood included the death penalty. Perhaps most importantly, in 1859, the very year in which the Wyandotte Constitution was adopted, the legislature adopted an extensive statutory scheme governing virtually all aspects of the death penalty, how it would be carried out, where it would be carried out, who would attend, what the governor could do uh, in the event that someone attempted to disrupt the proceedings, what to do in an instance of insanity, uh, and what to do uh, in a case of pregnancy. That historical background makes it clear what the founders had in mind at the time the Constitution was adopted. But there's a third point. This court has already held in Claypus that the Kansas death penalty does not, vi viol does not violate the spirit or the letter of section one of the Kansas Constitution. Indeed, uh, the language is worth quoting. The court said there that it would stretch the meaning of section one far beyond its intended purpose to apply it to the death penalty. Do you think that's binding on us now or is that, is that uh, or, or did, did Hodes change that analysis from Claypus? It's our view that it did not change uh, that, that mode of analysis for, for several reasons. Uh, even if you look at the Hodes analysis, uh, we don't believe there's anything about the Hodes decision that would cause the analysis the court engaged in there to adopt uh, the ban on the death penalty that is essentially being argued for here. And partly the reason is even the ideological and philosophical history of the Kansas Constitution as it was articulated in Hodes, refutes the argument of constitutionality. Uh, the John Locke theories of natural rights uh, supported the moral power or just right uh, to kill one who himself or herself kills another. Hodes itself, in the opinion, seemed to recognize this uh, when it stated that an individual encroaching on the domain of others is no longer protected by those Lockean natural rights. Now, in the Hodes decision, the court did attempt to distinguish some of these historical elements, but we would contend that the reasoning applied in Hodes does not apply here. First of all, the court in Hodes said that there was no basis for understanding what the people intended when they adopted uh, when they adopted the various statutes on abortion. In this case, uh, the people included an explicit reference to the death penalty in the Constitution, which we think is an important distinguishing factor uh, between this case and Hodes. In addition to the extensive post-constitutional history, including the carrying out of the death penalty on a regular basis in the 1860s up until, up until 1870. In addition, in Hodes, the court said that uh, the provision there had never been tested for constitutionality, the abortion statutes at issue in Hodes. Here, it wasn't initially, but eventually it was. In this case, in Claypus, reached the conclusion that I've already referred to. And finally, the third reason uh, in the Hodes decision, the differing rights for women and men, we would contend has no bearing on this case. Can I um, ask a few follow-up questions, Mr. Lau? Please. Um, setting aside Claypus to some degree for now, just focusing on the new landscape under Hodes, um, is it your contention that Mr. Cross has no Section 1 rights whatsoever? Uh, yes. That would be, we believe that's the correct legal analysis. There is no uh, right which he can base his argument on arising from section one of the constitution. It's and simply, and what, what makes Mr. Cross different from 
someone else? Why does he have no section right, section one rights and other Kansans do? Well, it's hard to compare Mr. Cross to sort of the unnamed uh, defendant with, with whatever those arguments might be, but in the Cross well, let's case- just say, let, Let's just say you and me. Well, in other words, I, if your argument is what you just said it is, that Mr. Cross has no Section 1 rights, um, presumably you would agree that other Kansans do have Section 1 rights. I'm just trying to understand the... I mean, obviously one analytical path to that is to say he forfeited those rights. Is, is that the state's position? Well, we think there are several distinctions. One of the distinctions is the textual textual distinction. Uh, yes, and, and, and to directly respond to your question, yes. The other distinction uh, is, is rooted in kind of the natural rights uh, ideology and philosophy that you forfeit your right when indeed you take the life of another and you commit a crime. Um, this is, a, this is a, not a challenge to the crime itself, but a challenge to the punishment. Uh, and under that Lockean Natural Rights Convention, uh, you have gone outside of the private domain uh, and you've gone into the public domain. You've done something that subjects you to the judgment of the larger uh, society. And in this case, that's the commission of a crime. In this case, the commission of a very serious crime, the taking of another life, uh, which makes this case different in our view. And so to answer directly, yes, uh, the concept of forfeiture uh, would support that. Now, and then, can I follow up on the, that Justice Stegall's point questions? Um, so down that analytical path, if, if forfeiture is implicated, what is our legal standard for evaluating where we go from that point forward? Is it absolute that, um, you know, once you determine there's a forfeiture, there is no right that's being burdened? Or is there a different analytical path or test that we have to consider um, to assess the burden being placed on section one versus uh, the state's interest in carrying out the punishment? So we would contend certainly in, in, in this case, given the totality of the circumstances, both the, the text and the natural rights argument about forfeiture, uh, that there, the analysis proceeds no further. Uh, now, uh, in a different case uh, involving uh, uh, other crimes where there isn't the textual issue, the tension that we have here between section one and section nine, uh, it, it may be that there is some, and, and we're, sort of, we're sort of sliding the analysis here into equal protection effectively. Uh, and so it, it may be that there is some future case where you slide into an equal protection analysis where you have this hierarchy uh, of course, the, the, the appellant here is arguing for strict scrutiny uh, down to a rational basis. Um, but we, I would say that is a case, that's a case for another day because of the uniqueness of the constitutional provisions at issue here. I'd what are the, the sorry, go ahead, Chief. I'd ask you the same question I asked your opposing counsel. Did our founders uh, once recognizing that we were perhaps no longer in section one land shoot us over to our section nine cruel or unusual punishment section. Is that where we go from there in terms of what rights are left to that person who is punished for a crime? I, th I think that's a, a reasonable argument, a position to take. Certainly um, section nine was dealt with by this court in Clapus uh, and, and, and found no violation, um, essentially adhering to US Supreme Court precedent. Uh, but uh, certainly that's uh, a different argument than we're making here, but would be a, an argument that you know, the, the, the death penalty opponents uh, have already tried and I suppose could attempt to try in the future. You, we, we, we analyze these, uh, at least with Hodes, we look to what the text, the first thing we do, is there a fundamental right? It's the first question that's asked. And I was gonna ask uh, Ms. Carver-Allman the same question. What is 
a right to life. What, what, what do you think that means? The, the, section one and the remainder of the Constitution doesn't give much guidance um, and, and neither did the discussion at the Constitutional Convention. We, we kind of get into it with maybe some of the philosophical underpinnings of the Constitution, but where do you think that, what, what, what does the, the text right to life mean or refer to in your mind? I think it's probably best understood in a general, uh, as the, uh, the court did in Hodes, in a general uh, Lockean sense. Uh, of a uh, right to be left alone, uh, a right uh, you know, not to have one's uh, integrity, uh, bodily integrity infringed on. Um, I think, I think it, it is a difficult uh, question to answer um, separate from what we already know to be the law from uh, cases like Hodes and others. Obviously, it's being deployed here in a direct argument to say that my right to life prevents the state from taking my life as a punishment for crime. And of course, the state's position is that that's simply wrong under the text and history of the Constitution and under the philosophical and ideological points made in the Hodes decision. If, if we disagree with you, and this, this is over with the no uh, section one assertion, there's, there's nothing left in section one, what, what is your position on what is the rational basis? If, if we get to a, a rational basis kind of application here, what is the rational basis that is left for the death penalty for us to say there is a rational basis or isn't? Or is that just a matter that we defer to the legislature to tell us what that is? Or wh where are you at with uh, what we should, what the test would be for rational basis in this case? What would we apply? Well, if, if the court views this in that equal protection analysis sense, uh, we would argue that it is the lowest standard, it's rational basis. Now, before you even get to that analysis, we would contend, as you alluded to, that that's a matter best left to the legislature. Uh, there, there are ways to change a constitution or to change death penalty law, and they both go through a vote of the people or through the legislature. Uh, and frankly, the arguments would be the same in either case, whether it's argued in this court uh, under rational basis or whether it's argued in the court of public opinion in the legislature. Uh, is, the, is the death penalty a deterrent? Uh, is the death penalty uh, uh, justified as retribution or is it justified as incapacitation? Those are the traditional arguments. The state's view is that they are best played out as historically they have in Kansas. Kansas, as I've articulated, adopted a death penalty uh, early on, uh, repealed it in 1907, readopted it in 1935, and then after the U.S. Supreme Court findings of unconstitutionality and then constitutionality, readopted it in 1994. Uh, so the people and the legislature have demonstrated their ability to take those uh, interests into account, and we would contend that they should be the first ones to rule on the issue. I'll jump in if Justice Rosen is, were you at the end of your line of questions? Thank you, Justice um, Beagle, I am, yeah. So, Mr. Lau, you talked about rational basis review. Um, under the Hodes decision, the argument for strict scrutiny makes sense to me, as does the argument that there simply is no right being infringed. But what doesn't make sense to me is rational basis review. How, do, how in the world with Hodes do we ever get to rational basis? I mean, either it's a fundamental right under which we apply strict scrutiny or there's no right at all. I, I don't understand the in-between position. I actually agree. There, is, there shouldn't be an in-between position. But, I mean, the state supports the first position that there is no right. Um, right, but you uh, made the, uh, are, sorry to talk over you. you. You made the argument rational basis should apply and I don't understand that. Well, so my point was, if we get to that stage in the analysis, which the state doesn't think that we should, uh, we think rational basis is the preferred approach over strict scrutiny and the well, distinction. It, it, it's preferred because it helps you obtain the result you want. But I think I just heard you say you agreed with me that as a, as a matter of legal coherence, it doesn't make much sense. 
I think that's fair. And I think that if there's going to be, the, I mean, basically the jump you make is if there is a fundamental right, uh, then you're, you're into this issue of what level of scrutiny. And typically, if you're going to follow Hodes, Hodes found that the fundamental right was subject to strict, strict scrutiny. Uh, now, I think there's the additional issue of what that means uh, in a case like this. Uh, but I think it's, it's the middle ground gets very mushy. Uh, and, and it's hard to find what the actual uh, legal articulation of a basis for it is. Um, which I'm comfortable saying because I think the state's case is so incredibly strong on the first point that there is no right. That makes sense. I appreciate the forthright answer. My my other question had to do with this with your with your stronger case, as you put it, the notion of forfeiture. What limits, if any, are there on the idea that a citizen can forfeit his or her Section One rights? I, because I, I guess my concern would be, um, is driving 65 and a 55, does that mean you forfeited your section one rights? I mean, what's the limiting principle? As, I, as you're positing the question, you're essentially saying that anyone who commits a crime has forfeited all their rights? Uh, I'm just asking for a limiting principle. I, I mean, I understand you can look at the extreme and say you, you can make the argument and you have that an individual like Mr. Cross, who has committed heinous crimes and been found guilty and sentenced to a death, sentenced to death by a jury, has forfeited those rights. But looking down the road, what are the limits on the concept of forfeiture? Well, I would say the, the limiting principle to the forfeiture concept is built into the system. It's the fact that as, a, as someone who is, uh, who is accused of a crime, uh, you have the, all of the procedural rights uh, to respond to those allegations. Um, and you're not, your, your, your right is, your forfeiture of your right is subject to uh, the power of the state being restrained by all of those valued procedural restrictions, and frankly, the other constitutional rights that protect you. Okay, so anyone who's been convicted of a crime, um, let's say simple possession of marijuana, has no Section 1 claims at all. They may have lots of other claims, but they have forfeited any Section 1. The only, the, the limiting principle I would see there is if, if punishments are deemed uh, woefully out of balance with the crime. Um, in other words, if, um, uh, if uh, 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 petty shoplifters uh, are going to be uh, uh, sentenced to, or there's a statute that says that's a, a felony and you can go to prison for the rest of your life, um, is there going to be a section one uh, liberty interest that could be articulated there? Perhaps. Uh, that's that's the limiting principle that comes to mind under the circumstances. So the scope of forfeiture is in part defined by the legislature, for example, through their um, definition of capital murder. Um, but beyond that, the constitutional limits on forfeiture would be like our section nine, any due process guarantees. Etc. Is that your argument? I just wanted to make sure I understood it correctly. I think I think that's fair to say. Yes. Are there other questions? Mr. Lau, you'd like to summarize, or do you sure. your argument? Uh, thank you, Your Honors, for the opportunity to argue today. In conclusion. Uh, we believe the answer to the question posed by the court is that Hodes and Nauter, Nauser has no effect uh, whatsoever on the Kansas death penalty being unconstitutional under Section 1 of the Bill of Rights. The text and history of the Constitution and this court's decision in Clapus bar such a result. Mr. Cross moved outside the private domain when he committed multiple murders, and Kansas is not prohibited by its Constitution from imposing the death penalty. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Lau. Ms. carver Almond, you may reserve uh, five minutes, I believe. Thank you, Chief Justice. So I wanna start in on this concept of forfeiture and I wanna, I wanna circle back to section six. And um, maybe this will help with Justice Biles' question earlier. So if we assume when you commit a crime, you have forfeited all of your section one rights, that gets you back into a condition of slavery, which is prohibited under section six. So I, I think that that is how those two kind of interact together. That's yet another way that those two kind of interact together because we know that our founders, and, and you know, I understand the, the urge to think of slavery as um, African-American slavery, Civil War era issues, but uh, you know, there's, there's also a lot of discussion after the Civil War in history, of course, of how um, using penal labor and, and the 13th Amendment, for example, has different language than our um, Section 6 does to essentially force folks back into a condition of slavery through due process of law. And um, I think that, you know, to the extent that our founders were obviously very concerned about slavery, um, the argument that you just forfeit all of your section one rights as soon as you're convicted of a crime um, would be in opposition to that. Um, next, I wanna answer, oh, sorry. Before you go on, uh, to follow up on Justice Stiegel's questions and points, if the fundamental right to life is forfeited in some way, but not by life for life, as you suggest, does the fundamental right lose its nature as fundamental such that rational basis would then apply? I don't understand still where that mechanism is in the text. Under the 14th Amendment due process clause, Sure, I understand how we get there. But if we assume that constitutions are written to keep citizens free from government intrusion, then um, you know I can do a lot of government intrusion by declaring things crimes and then convicting people of them and then taking away all of their rights. So that's a, that's a pretty big loophole if that is indeed the loophole that our founders left. Um, no, Can ahead. you explain to me that your section six argument that you started off with in rebuttal, wouldn't that then prohibit the state from imposing any sentence of incarceration as well? I mean, isn't forfeiture sort of the basis of any uh, sentence of incarceration? Well, and again, just as well, that's the difference between giving up all of your fundamental rights and some of your fundamental rights. And prisoners really only give up some of their fundamental rights. They still have rights in prison. They still have quite a few rights in prison. Now they're lessened, but they still have them. Only um, through absolute slavery, no fundamental rights at all, or the death penalty, are you completely losing your fundamental rights. The absolute nature of the, the penalty. Exactly, exactly, Justice Wall. Let me, uh, let me ask if, uh, and, and I, I know you've got limited time, but, uh, and you've got points you want to get to, but um, this notion of, of rational basis test, assume with me that we have a penalty that has been found to be appropriate, uh, has been found not to be cruel or unusual punishment, okay? wouldn't that necessarily mean it would pass a rational basis test? Well, uh, I think that, you know, there are, are certainly some, um, some different arguments that we can make under the Kansas constitution that have not been made thus far to that end. And, and a lot of that is, is laid out in our brief. Um, And also, I think you have to consider, and it's, it's, we're not making a section nine argument in our brief, but we are sort of, um, you know, if the death penalty is arbitrary, if it's discriminatory, which are, are typically sort of eighth amendment section nine arguments, then it isn't a, a compelling interest um, narrowly tailored to further the right to life too. So the, the two are, are very, very connected. And, um, you know, it, 
we're in such new Kansas constitutional territory. And that's, that's uh, one of the things that uh, I heard Mr. Um, Lau talk about how, you know, no one has really challenged this up to Clapis and, and, and Clapis, obviously they didn't do it quite the right way, but nobody knew what section one meant <laughs> until about 18 months ago. I think that the 200 pages of the, the Hodes decision probably outweighs everything that's been said about section one before or since. And so it gets very hard to build those challenges and, and the section nine challenges, again, we're not making that argument today, but um, it, it's a different understanding now that this court has explained what section one rights look like and, and that they are actually indeed judicially enforceable. Um, I wanted to um, address Justice Rosen's question um, about what a right to life is. And uh, the thing that I heard my opposing counsel say in response to that question, those are all liberty <laughs> interests. Like life and liberty have to mean something different. They're two separate words. And so I think, um, you know, the right to be free from interference, the right to go about your business, those are really liberty interests. The life interest, uh, you know, as we're arguing it today, is, is, the right to be breathing, I would I would define it that way. Um, it has to mean something different than liberty does. I don't think there could be any overlap in those concepts because I, I kind of see an overlap, but you don't. You think there's a distinct, it is actually the physical being, the right to breathe, doesn't go much beyond that. There could be some overlap, but there still have to be differences. It, it, it can be a, um, oh, you know, if you're making a Venn diagram, it's like this, but it can't be like this. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I was thinking of a Venn diagram. Exactly. OK. Yeah. 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 And, and very lastly, I see that I am out of time. I wanted to make the point that um, we are not arguing what the attorneys did in Clavis. And I think this is where I started and this is where I want to end. We are well, not, before you end, I, I know you're sure. going to end on something, but I but it, it brings up another area that what about the right to defend oneself? I attack someone and and with with a knife or sorry, Justice Biles and Justice Stiegel, but with with a knife and and um, that person defends him or herself with a like instrument or shoots me Um by my attacking that person with a knife, have, have I forf what what is there any or the the person that defends themselves? Um, what 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 about those consequences when you're defending yourself? And what what are the implications of Section One under your position for each individual for for the for the combatant and the one defending themselves? Sure, and that goes to the death penalty as a form of self defense, and in a theoretical world where we convicted someone and you know knew that they were guilty didn't have all of the innocence problems that we've talked about in some of the briefing and we took them out and we executed them the next day um, that might be self-defense but I have I have argued cases in front of this court before where um, you know the the classic situation is two people get in a fist fight and one person walks away and five minutes later comes back with a gun and kills that person. And that is not self-defense. That is premeditated first degree murder. And that is what we do with our death penalty. We are not, um, you know, by the time 20 or 30, or we don't even know how many years at this point have passed, the need for self-defense is, uh, is so much diminished as to be non-existent. you'd like to finish the point you were making, go ahead, please. Thank you, Justice Lukert. And uh, so I wanna get back to where I started. And that is that, that we are not arguing that uh, Kansas, that the death penalty should be banned in Kansas for all time. We are arguing that the state should have to show a compelling interest and show that their statute is narrowly tailored to further that interest. We're talking about taking someone's life. And the fact that we're talking about doing that with uh, very low levels of judicial scrutiny is, is disturbing. And based on the text of the Constitution, based on the history as we've talked about today, and also based on substantive due process, this court should follow Hodes here. And if, um, you know, if this court follows Hodes, 
we believe that that the correct result will will eventually at least be that Mr. Cross is resentenced to life without possibility of parole. Thank you. Thank you to both counsel. We will take this appeal under advisement. Court is now in recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning.